This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Three monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. I'd like to welcome you to the monthly meeting of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. We are a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. We are one of the largest local vegetarian societies in the country with more than 1,600 members. Now it's time for our special guest for this evening. We're happy to have with us tonight Linda Day. Born and raised in Hawaii, Linda is a graduate of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she is currently the communications coordinator for the Office of Sustainability. She's worked also as a writer, editor, and in public relations. An enduring environmentalist, animal rights advocate, and ethical vegetarian, Linda has served on the board of directors of both Animal Rights Hawaii and the Vegetarian Society. Her environmental pursuits have included work with the Sierra Club and Conservation Council for Hawaii, and she was the statewide co-coordinator for the 20th anniversary celebration of Earth Day. This year, she was instrumental in the development of the UH Manoa Sustainability Courtyard, which includes Ono Pono, the only vegetarian restaurant in the University of Hawaii system. The subject of her talk tonight is Green Cuisine, What You Eat Can Save the World. Please welcome Linda Day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, open this guy up. The lay gets a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So beautiful. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. In doing this research, I tried not to look at just Actually, I tried not to look at all at vegetarian organizations or animal rights organizations because I know even I, when I look at those, I think that maybe there's some um, agenda there. So I tried to really look at environmental organizations in order for the, um, the data to be as unbiased as possible. And then before I actually get into this, I wanted to thank just a few people. I wanted to thank Bill Harris for helping me with this PowerPoint presentation. He was invaluable. He's a board member. He's one of the founding members, actually, of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. I wanted to thank Jim Brown, who I just saw. There he is. Jim Brown for setting up these talks, you know, in general, all through the year. And then Ari Okada Berkeley, who's their publicist, the Veg Society's volunteer publicist, who got me on, whether I liked it or not, got me on the morning show yesterday morning at 6 in the morning. So I'm going to start with, who says eating meat is bad for the environment? And as I say, I really try to focus on environmental organizations. For one, the Union of Concerned Scientists um, says that eating meat is bad for the environment. They released, in 1999, a report titled The Seven Most Harmful Consumer Activities, which is a comparison of consumer spending patterns with their effect on four broad environmental problems, global warming, air pollution, water pollution, and the alteration of natural habitats. So basically, this report evaluates the ecological impacts, the imp ecological costs of various activities and products that people engage in. So here's their report in, the, in graph form. As you can see, uh, actually they were surprised when they had their news conference, they were surprised that meat and poultry came in only second to driving vehicles in terms of its environmental impact. 
but that's a significant impact. And again, that's in terms of global warming, air pollution, water pollution, and the alteration of natural habitats. So their deputy director, his name is Warren Leon, says the industrial production of, me of meat, poultry and pork, pollutes waterways and air, fouls the land, and gobbles up, and he said gobbles up, valuable resources. Meat production sh showed up second only to vehicles in terms of environmental destruction. We can ease the burden on the environment by eating less meat. Other organizations and individuals who say the way meat currently is produced is harmful to the earth. The Sierra Club. The Sierra Club's campaign to protect America's water from factory farms, one of the organization's four national priority campaigns, is committed to keeping factory farm pollution out of America's drinking water, lakes, and rivers, and eliminating the threats that what they call concentrated animal feeding operations, commonly known as factory farms, pose to our public health and rural heritage. So they have four national priority campaigns, and one of them is to reduce the consumption of meat because of its impact on fresh water. Rainforest Action Network says, rainforest beef is typically found in fast food hamburgers or processed beef products. In both 1993 and 1994, the U.S. imported over 200 million pounds of fresh and frozen beef from Central American countries. Two-thirds of these countries' rainforests have been cleared in part to raise cattle whose meat is exported to profit the U.S. food industry. When it enters the U.S., the beef is not labeled with its country of origin, so there's no way to trace it back to its source. Reducing your consumption of meat will reduce demand for it, cutting back on pressure to clear more forests for cattle. So that's from the Rainforest Action Network, seven things you can do to save the rainforest. And I could go on and on, Friends of the Earth, Earth Save, Waste Reduction Resource Center, E, the environmental magazine, some of you might have seen that, um, says there's never been a better time for environmentalists to become vegetarians. Evidence of the environmental impacts of a meat-based diet is piling up at the same time its health effects are becoming better known. Meanwhile, full-scale industrialized factory farming, which allows diseases to spread quickly as animals are raised in close confinement, has given rise to recent highly publicized epidemics of meat-borne illnesses, and I'm sure you're familiar with those. And lastly, who says meat is bad for the meat consumption or production is bad for the environment? Albert Einstein, who actually had something to say about just about everything, said, nothing will benefit human health and increase chances of survival of life on Earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. I'm going to look at demand and supply, the growing demand and increasing demand. This is from World Watch magazine. The, it's their cover story, and it, it's called, is meat, is meat Sustainable? And their overwhelming answer is no. So they say per capita meat consumption has more than doubled in the past half century. As, so you, get, you have to kind of think about this uh, quote. I had to read it uh, a couple of times. So per capita meat consumption has more than doubled in the past half century as global population has continued to increase. So not only, so what that means is not only has each person begun to eat more meat per capita meat consumption, but there are more people doing it. So as a result, the overall demand for meat has increased fivefold in the last 50 years. This is a map of the daily caloric intake or calorie intake made up of animal products around the world. With world population, well, let me just say that the darker the darker areas are higher percentages on areas like the purple and the dark blues are higher percentages. Dark blue is 35 to 40 percent of the, the amount of calories taken in by animal products. And the purple is 40 to 45 percent. With world population projected to increase by 50 percent to 8.8 .8 billion by 2030, our ability to adequately feed people will face growing challenges. Scaling back on heightened levels of resource-intensive meat production may be the best way to ensure food security for all people into the next century. That's from the International Development Research Center, um, which is a Canadian research center, from a, from a publication called How Meat-Centered Eating Patterns Affect Food Security and the Environment. Another one on world population and food. World population is projected to soar from 6.1 billion in 2000 to 7.9 billion in 2025 and 9.3 billion in 2050. If economic development 
including the elimination of hunger, which is normally a good thing, right? We want to eliminate hunger. But if we handle that, then people are going to be eating more. There'll be more people eating more. So the food demand is going to be greater. So if economic development proceeds in low-income countries, then the total demand for food will increase approximately threefold. A couple of researchers from the Harvard Medical School. This is from the Atlas of Population and Environment. It's a really well-respected compilation of statistics. Meat demand rises strongly as countries grow wealthier and urbanize. Citizens in developed countries eat four times more meat than those in developing countries, a far greater difference than pertains for grain consumption. This is meat and milk consumption worldwide. So, you know, what I just said, citizens in developed countries eat four times more meat than those in developing countries. You can see that on this graph. This is 1990. But... This is estimated demand. You can see that developing nations are, are wanting to eat more meat. They're following America's pattern, as they are with things like wanting cars and TVs, you know, consumption in other ways. This is animal products in the human diet by continent. I think the main thing is that you can see that North America consumes, in terms of animal products, consumes twice as much as Latin America and the Caribbean. Europe consumes almost as much in animal products in terms of calories. Africa is only at, at 100. North America is 1,000, a little over 1,000 calories per day of animal products. Africa, right below it, is only 178 calories per day. Big difference. To the right of North America is Latin America and the Caribbean with 541 calories, so half the calories consumed in North America. It's just to give you an idea that, well, let me just read this quote and it'll tell you. This is, um, again, from the Atlas of Population and Environment. China, with the world's largest population, is the, is the highest overall producer and consumer of meat, but the highest per capita consumption, which is what this shows, in the world is that of the United States. The average United States citizen consumes more than three times the global average of 37 kilos per person per year. Africans consume less than half the global average. South Asians consume the least at under six kilos per person per year. So that's demand. And as we have seen, developing countries are, are wanting more meat. Even though developed countries tend to eat more, developing countries are desirous of it. So then we have to look at supply. How is supply being met? So this is a graph of fish and meat production. 242 million tons of meat were produced in 2002 which is an increase of 2.5% over 2001, the year before. 2.5% in one year seems like a big increase to me. And that's from the UN Food and Agriculture Association. They, they predict that meat production will grow to more than 300 million tons by 2020. So just the basic idea is demand is really increasing worldwide and supply is also really increasing worldwide to, to meet that. This is top fish producers and top meat producers. Um, I'm just going to say assessments made in 1999 found that 44% of major natural fish stocks are already exploited to their maximum sustainable yield. So the growth of world agriculture, this is, it just shows, again, that um, supply is increasing to meet demand. I was talking to someone who's on the board who attends all of these lectures, and he was saying that there's a surprising amount of new people here. So I think it's actually maybe people who consider themselves environmentalists who may not be vegetarians, but are kind of interested in, like you say, kind of transitioning. So I'm hoping that some of these statistics are going to help them say, hey, yeah, I, I guess I need to make this move, you know. I was actually thinking of asking people, how many people are vegetarians? How many people are, consider themselves environmentalists? And how many people feel like they're vegetarians because they're environmentalists, like because they're aware of the impacts? How many people are vegetarians? I'm just curious. How many people here are vegetarians by show of hands? Yeah. So, yeah, some and some not. So, okay. Yeah. How many of you consider yourselves environmentalists? Okay. More. Okay. And then we'll do the, you know, the overlap. How many of you consider yourselves vegetarians because, of, because you're aware of the environmental impacts? Ooh, not very, not very many. 
So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, the rest of you who are, are vegetarians will get to go tell your friends, hey, here's another reason I'm a vegetarian. And those of you who are environmentalists but not vegetarians, maybe you'll decide to switch. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. This is world agricult- aquaculture. So this is like farming with fish. Okay, so increasingly... Because, as I just said, assessments in 1999 found that 44%, almost half, of major natural fish stocks are already exploited to their maximum sustainable yield. And, you know, 16% are overfished and 6% are depleted on top of that. Increasingly, the world is turning to aquaculture to maintain fish supplies. It's the fastest growing food production system in the world, with global production increasing by 11% annually through most of the 1990s, until about a quarter of the fish brought to table came from aquaculture. This is a, the U.S. population of farm animals, basically, and you can see that chickens are way ahead of, in the race, if you can call it that. Since the early 1960s, the number of livestock have increased 60%, from 3 billion to more than 5 billion, and the number of fowl have quadrupled from 4 billion to 16 billion, so you can see that here. And again, that's from the U.N. Food and Agriculture Association. So what are we looking at here? This is 2000. That quote was from 2003, which is why it's a little bit higher. The numbers are a little bit higher. But so what they're saying in 2003 is it's increased from 3 billion to 5 billion for livestock and 4 billion to 16 billion for fowl. I'm sure you, uh, you know, those of you who eat meat or those of you who have friends who eat meat, I'm sure you know that they've all started to not eat, oh, I don't eat, you know, red meat, but I eat chicken. So that's what's being reflected in the production end of it is people are wanting more chicken, more fowl, and so that's what they're, you know, producing. So how is meat produced? I just want to really quickly go over this. Industrial feedlots, also called factory farms or CAFOs, I talked about those earlier, are the most rapidly growing production system for these animals, producing 43% of the world's beef and more than half of the world's pork and poultry. So what are factory farms? industrial feedlots or CFOs. And I just, I'm just going to show you pictures because I think one picture says it, you know, a thousand words. So this is how the chickens live in factory farms. And this is how the pigs live in factory farms. This is their life. They don't have a natural social interaction and they're deprived of exercise and all that. And I know this is not an animal rights lecture. This is an environmental lecture, but it is pretty uh, inhumane. And then they are slaughtered and processed and um, it's not a really very nice process at all. So how is producing meat harmful to the environment? This is a quote again from World Watch magazine, the one that's just about to come out. As environmental science has advanced, it has become apparent that the human appetite for animal flesh is a driving force behind virtually every major category of environmental damage now threatening the human future. And I'll let you just read that list. Deforestation, erosion, freshwater scarcity, air and water pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss, social injustice, the destabilization of communities, and the spread of disease. Like it or not, meat eating is becoming a problem for everyone on the planet. Here's a short list of that. That, by the way, Bill and I, when we were putting this slide together or this presentation together, we weren't sure what that little picture is. And someone identified for me on Maui that it's a fish. The waste is released and it clogs up the waterways. It prevents the, there being enough oxygen in the water so the fish can't breathe. Things like algae overproduce and it, it just chokes the waterways and so unfortunately that's what happens to them. What I'd like to do is go through, there are seven basic categories, major categories of environmental impact that, are, that have conventionally been regarded as critical to sustainability of human civilization. And the reason we're looking at the sustainability of human civilization is because, the, you know, in the old days, environmentalists used to say, save the planet, save the planet. Well, at some point we realized that the planet was probably going to be okay, that it was going to recover on its own and find its own equilibrium and balance again, but that we humans might, you know, go down the tubes and take a whole lot of species with us. And that's apparently what's happening. So how does meat production negatively impact these seven major categories? First, I'm going to talk about deforestation. This is a quote from the World Rainforest Report. In Central America, 40% of all the rainforests have been cleared or burned down in the last 40 years, mostly for cattle pasture. 
Meat is too expensive for the poor in these beef exporting countries, yet in some cases, ca cattle have ousted highly productive traditional agriculture. The area, this is the Amazon rainforest. The area lost to de deforestation in the Amazon in 2002 to 2003, one year, one year is expected to exceed 25,000 square kilometers, a plot the size of Uruguay, <laughs> a country. Cattle ranching is the reason behind most of this loss. The cattle population has exploded in the Amazon from 26 million in 1990 to 57 million in 2002. And that's from World Watch, the World Watch Institute. So from now on, the question of whether we get our protein from animals or plants has direct implications for how much more of the world's remaining forests we have to raise. One last quote. This is again from the Atlas of Population and the Environment. Natural forests, once characterized as jungle that required clearing, that's the way we used to regard them, are now increasingly regarded as important ecological and economic resources for both nations and the planet. They stabilize the landscape by generating rainfall and maintaining soil, generating rainfall, groundwater, and river flows. So I'm going to move on to fresh water. So this is the national water intake for humans and livestock. And it's in billions of gallons of water per year. So you can see that in terms of fresh water, all of these farm animals that we're consuming are taking up a huge amount of water. So a few years ago, water experts calculated that we humans are now taking half the available fresh water on the planet, leaving the other half to be divided among a million or more species. We depend on many of those species for our own survival. They provide all the food we eat and oxygen we breathe, among other services. If we break it down species by species, we find that the heaviest water use is by the animals we raise from meat. One of the easiest ways to reduce demand for water is to reduce the amount of meat we eat. And that's again from World Watch magazine. This is water consumption for beef and plant crops. So this is gallons of water used to produce a pound of whatever that is on this table. So you can see that we use a tremendous amount of water for all of that beef and not very much for the grains, some of which are fed, most of which actually are fed to livestock. This is a mind-blowing quote. Let's say you take a shower every day. You can kind of gloss over this first part. This is just kind of doing the math. Let's say you take a shower every day and your shower is average seven minutes and the flow rate through your shower head is two gallons per minute. You would use at that rate 5,000, about 5,000 gallons of water to shower every day for a year. When you compare that figure to the amount the Water Education Foundation calculates is used for the production of every pound of California beef, which is 2,464 gallons, about 2,500 gallons, about half that, you realize something extraordinary. In California today, you may save more water by not eating a pound of beef, a pound of beef, by not eating a pound of beef than you would by not showering for six entire months. And that's from a book called The Food Revolution, How Your Diet Can Help Save Your Life and the World by John Robbins. Standard diet of a person in the United States requires 4,200 gallons of water per day, and that includes animals drinking water and irrigation of crops and processing and all of that. A person on a vegan diet, so that's, if you're a meat eater, 4,200 4, gallons of water per day. A person on a vegan diet requires only 300 gallons a day. So let's see, that's a 16th. That's a 16th of the water if you're a vegan every day. A report from the International Water Management Institute noting that 840 million of the world's people remain undernourished recommends finding ways to produce more food using less water. The report notes that it takes 550 liters of water to produce enough flour for one loaf of bread in developing countries, but up to 7,000 liters of water to produce 100 grams of beef. And that's the UN Commission on Sustainable Development, a publication called Water, More Nutrition Per Drop. So a third major category of envir environmental impact is waste disposal. This is Bill's title, <laughs> the scoop on poop. <laughs> it's basically farm animal feces. How much is generated in the United States? This is millions of tons per year. And while you're looking at that, and you can see that it's, you know, we, the, the livestock produce way more than we humans do. Here's, here's us guys, right? Humans. Here's everybody else, all the other livestock. 
Carefully used. Carefully is like the best word. Yeah. Bring back the light Right. If, if it's carefully used, that's the only thing. Is it, unfortunately, instead of putting it back on the land and letting it sink in, it's often just released into the water and it really messes up the waterways. And, and that's why, for instance, that's why Sierra Club has it as one of their four major national campaigns. If it, if it were used as fertilizer, that would be great. But because it's released into the rivers and lakes, it has a detrimental impact. And, and you'll see that a little bit later. I think we have to monitor the disposal, and then they'll find a better way to, to take care of it and probably find a profitable way to handle it. America's drinking water, rivers and lakes, are at risk. This is from the Sierra Club. Speaking of the Sierra Club. America's drinking water, rivers and lakes, are at risk from giant corporate-owned factory farms. These concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, confine thousands of animals, we saw them earlier, confine thousands of animals in one facility and produce staggering amounts of animal waste in the process. 2.7 trillion pounds per year. You know, we can't even get a million in our brain or a billion in our brain, and this is trillion. 2.7 trillion pounds per year. Too often, this waste leaks into our rivers and streams, fouling our air, contaminating our drinking water, and spreading disease. This is a manure lagoon. When we labeled it, we said overflow, but in actuality, if you look kind of near the bottom, a little below the halfway point, there, there are trucks, and what they're doing is they're pumping it into our nearby ravine, which unfortunately led to a water source, waterway, so it killed a whole bunch of fish and other animals, you know, just out of this one manure lagoon. Giant livestock farms, which can house hundreds of thousands of pigs, chickens, or cows, hundreds of thousands, produce vast amounts of waste. In fact, in the United States, these factory farms generate more than 130 times the amount of waste that people do, 130 times the amount of waste that we do. According to the EPA, livestock waste has polluted more than 27,000 miles of rivers and contaminated groundwater in dozens of states, and that's from the NRDC, National Resources Defense Council. Fourth category I'm going to talk about is energy consumption and global warming. Meat production contributes to global warming in two main ways. So one is fossil fuels. Currently, our principal source of energy is carbon-rich fossil fuels, which when burned, emit carbon dioxide and other gases that blanket our planet, creating global warming. It takes far more of these fuels to produce, store, and transport meat than to produce, store, and transport the equivalent amount of protein from plant sources. It takes, on average, 28 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce one calorie of meat protein for human consumption, whereas it takes only 3.3 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce one calorie of protein from grain for human consumption. So let's see, let's do the math. 3.3 is not even close to 4, so that's one-seventh. 4 would be one-seventh of 28. So it takes one-seventh of the fossil fuels, you know, which again contribute greatly to global warming, this is the conversion, basically the conversion of fossil fuels to food. So it's, ca- at the bottom it says calories of food per calories of fossil fuel. So it's how much, how much in fossil fuels it takes to produce how much of each of these things. You can see that it takes, you get a lot of soybeans out of a little bit of fossil fuel. You don't get very much pork, beef, ch- or chicken out of the same amount of um, one calorie of fossil fuels. So it's really an inefficient way to use fossil fuels. The second way that livestock production, meat production, contributes to global warming is that livestock, which includes the 1.3 billion cattle in the world, release substantial amounts of potent global warming gases into the atmosphere as a byproduct of digestion. Livestock, this is from the Atlas of Population and Environment again. Livestock herds are large-scale producers of gas emissions. All animals emit carbon dioxide, while ruminants also produce another greenhouse gas, methane. A third gas responsible for global warming, nitrous oxide, is released from manure. For each of these gases that cause global warming, such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, emissions are the product of population multiplied by consumption per person, multiplied by emissions per unit of consumption. This is kind of complicated sounding, but in the case of methane emissions, the population element, that's us, and our demand for cows, you know, cow meat, um, beef, the population element is very significant. 
Rice paddies and livestock are among the most important human-induced sources. And that's from also, again, from the Atlas of Population and Environment. Livestock emit 16% of the world's annual production of methane, powerful greenhouse gas. That's from World Watch Institute, State of the World 2004. One ton of methane, the chief agricultural greenhouse gas, has the global warming potential of 23 tons of carbon dioxide. A dairy cow produces about 75 kilograms of methane a year, equivalent to over 1.5 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Atmospheric concentrations of methane increased by 150% over the past 250 years, while carbon dioxide concentrations increased by only 30%. So all this cattle that we keep adding are putting out all this extra methane, and it's pumping up the amount of methane that's going out into the atmosphere and contributing to global warming. This is from the United Nations Environment Program, Unit on Climate Change. There's a strong link between human diet and methane emissions from livestock. As beef consumption rises or falls, the number of livestock will, in general, also rise or fall, as will the related methane emissions. Latin America has the highest regional emissions per capita, due primarily to large cattle populations in the beef exporting countries, notably Brazil and Argentina. The fifth category is food productivity of farmland. So that's basically how we use land to produce food. This is a graph of how much land to produce how much protein, land use efficiency. This is kilograms of protein per acre per year. So if you take an acre and you farm it for a year, what do you get out of it? You get lots of grass and leaf proteins, all the veggies, cabbage, snap beans, green peas, all of that. Way down, you have beef, pork, lamb, eggs, chicken, milk. So given an acre of land for a year, you produce way more of all of these other food crops than you do of meat. A meat eater's diet, this is from a scientist from the Department of Geography in the University of Manitoba, Canada, October 2002. A meat eater's diet requires two to four times more land than a vegetarian's diet. This is from the World Hunger Program at Brown University. Recent world harvests, if equitably distributed with no diversion of grain to feeding livestock, could produce a vegetarian diet to six billion people, whereas a meat-rich diet like that of people in the wealthier nations could support only 2.6 billion. This is U.S. crops grown as farm animal feed. These things could be fed to people for the most part, but instead we're feeding them to farm animals. Producing meat requires large amounts of grain. Most of the corn and soybeans harvested in the world are used to fatten livestock. That's from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This is U.S., but that's a world they're saying in the world. Most of the corn and soybeans harvested in the world are used to fatten livestock. Food productivity of farmland is gradually falling behind population growth. Short of stabilizing population, which they estimate, World Watch magazine estimates, will take another half century, only one major option remains, to cut back sharply on meat consumption because conversion of grazing land to food crops will increase the amount of food produced. Okay, so this is U.S. agricultural land use. Millions of acres, you can see it's all going to cattle grazing primarily, and then animal food, other animal feed, and then below that, hay for farm animals. Very little for fruits and vegetables for us. Of the world's agricultural land, only about a third is used to grow crops, with the remaining two-thirds dedicated to livestock pasture. Today, more than 70% of the grain produced in the United States is fed to livestock, much of it to cattle. Sixth category is diseases in humans that are related to food production. It's now clear that the vast majority of public health problems are environmental, rather than genetic in nature. A report by the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates that 89% of U.S. beef ground into patties contains traces of the deadly E. coli strain, 89% of all U.S. beef. Animal waste contains disease-causing pathogens such as Salmonella E. coli, Cryptosporidium, and Fecal coliform, which can be 10 to 100 times more concentrated than in human waste. More than 40 diseases can be transferred to humans through manure. That's from NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council. This next quote is from the American Dietetic Association. And again, these are people who don't really have an agenda as far as save the animals or anything like that. They're just looking at human health. Not only is mortality from coronary heart disease lower in vegetarians than in non-vegetarians, but vegetarian diets have also been successful in arresting coronary heart disease. 
Scientific data suggests positive relationships between a vegetarian diet and reduced risk for obesity, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, mellitus, and some types of cancer. This last quote is from Jeremy Rifkin, interview in the LA Times. The irony of the food production system is that millions of wealthy consumers in developed countries are dying from what he calls diseases of affluence, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, and cancer, brought on by gorging on fatty grain-fed beef and other meats, while the poor in the third world are dying of diseases of poverty, brought on by being denied access to land to grow food grain for their families. The seventh major category that's negatively impacted by food production is biodiversity loss and threat of extinction. Here we've got Home on the Range. On Maui, I actually hummed Home on the Range to see if people would kind of guess what, what the next category was, and I'll spare you guys that. Rich and diverse grasslands have been trampled, quote, trampled and replanted with monoculture grass for large-scale cattle grazing. So you can see that in this photo. You know, this used to be, this used to be a picture of diversity, both in terms of the grassland and in terms of the animals on it. And now we're looking at all the same kind of grass with all the same kind of steers. Not only are they all cows, but they're the same kind of cow. The shortage of pastures has also helped change the kind of livestock being raised. The global population of cattle, which feed on pastures, is rising much less quickly than animals that eat from feedlots, such as pigs, now the world's largest meat source, and poultry, which also now exceeds beef production. But in, and this is the biodiversity part. But intensive livestock systems, like factory farms, tend to reduce barnyard diversity in the same way that the green revolution in crops has reduced it amongst plants. Many traditional livestock breeds have disappeared. So as I said in this, in this last one, you're looking at all the same kind of cow. So diversity, which is really important to keeping anything healthy, any population healthy. What we're doing is we're, making, we're reducing the species that can contribute to any given gene pool. And that's, that's dangerous, actually. These are photos from Costa Rican and Peruvian rainforests. Forests are the home of between 50% and 90% of all land species in the world. I'm going to say that again. Forests are the home of between 50% and 90% of all land species in the world. If tropical deforestation continues at present rates for the next 30 years, it is estimated that 5 to 11% of forest species will eventually be lost. This is a quote from Jane Goodall. You probably know her. She's worked for decades with gorillas and chimpanzees, all the primates. She says, The animals have gone. The forest is silent. And when the logging camps finally move, what is left for the indigenous people? Nothing. Again, we're talking about biodiversity and extinction. This is the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, what they actually call the dead zone. Scientists call the dead zone. Nutrients and animal waste cause algal blooms like algae, which use up oxygen in the water, contributing to a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where there's not enough oxygen to support aquatic life. The dead zone stretched over 7,700 square miles during the summer of 1999. 7,000, 7, 8,000 basically square miles in one summer. So what we're looking at is the Mississippi, basically the Mississippi, all of the tributaries that contribute to the Mississippi River. So all of this animal agriculture, both in terms of crops that go to feeding the animals and the animals themselves processing them into meat for our consumption, all of that, well not all of it hopefully, but a lot of it ends up in this river, in the Mississippi River, which all flows down, running through all of those states. It all flows down, enters the Gulf of Mexico, where that red, red swatch is down in the body of water, the Gulf of Mexico. It says hypoxic zone, hypo being under, like hypodermic, under your skin, and oxic oxygen. So it's all of this stuff goes down, flows into the Gulf of Mexico, and creates in 1999 this 8,000 square mile dead zone where nothing could live in the water. This is from the U.S. EPA. Nutrients, including nitrogen, are the fifth leading type of pollutants contributing to the impairment of rivers and streams. Nutrients are the leading contributor of pollutants to impaired lakes. Nitrogen occurs in meat and poultry products discharges in several forms, including ammonia and nitrate. Ammonia is toxic to aquatic life and reduces the level of oxygen in the water body. Too much ammonia and other forms of nitrogen can lead to fish kills, 
reduced biodiversity, and growth of toxic organisms. Aquaculture has become a major threat to coastal ecosystems, particularly mangroves. I didn't realize this. From Ecuador to the Philippines, mangroves are being converted on a huge scale into brackish shrimp ponds and what has been characterized as the aquatic equivalent of slash and burn farming. Most are productive for less than a decade before loss of nutrients and a buildup of toxins forces them to be abandoned and replaced. And lastly, as the planet becomes more crowded, this, I didn't know this either, there's this, there's this thing called bushmeat, which is going into the wilds or into reserves, and, well, I'll read it. As the planet becomes more crowded, poor populations are increasingly venturing into wildlife reserves looking for meat, and not always just for their own subsistence. The growing traffic in bushmeat from wild animals hunted commercially for food is decimating the remaining populations of gorillas, chimpanzees, and other primates. Not that it probably matters, but these are our closest genetic relatives, and they're being wiped out as well for food production. So is there, with all of this kind of dismal information, is there hope for the environment? As I did uh, this web search, there were three things that I found that I thought were encouraging. Uh, One is that they're establishing tighter regulations on resource use, water and energy use, and on discharges into, like, water bodies and the air. On February 26, 2004, just this past year, EPA established new wastewater discharge limits for the meat and poultry products MPP industry. The MPP regulation affects about 170 facilities. Don't let that small number throw you. These are huge. I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of animals in these facilities. About 170 facilities that discharge wastewater from slaughtering, rendering, and other processes such as cleaning, cutting, and smoking. The new rule reduces discharges of conventional pollutants, ammonia, and nitrogen to rivers, lakes, and streams. And also, the rule establishes effluent limits, that's discharge again, effluent limits for poultry processors for the first time. So if you remember back Chickens were way ahead of all the other livestock. This is the first time that we've had discharge limits on poultry production. So this is a really encouraging thing. For poultry, there was no rule before. They're responding to people like the Sierra Club saying, you guys, you can't keep letting this stuff go out into the water. It's, it's killing us. I think it's probably as stringent as they could be. I mean, even if there have been regulations to, to monitor these facilities, it's really tough. And I imagine that's a big problem. But at least it shows that we're moving in the right direction, that they're more stringent about what's being re- released, and they're finally doing poultry, which is, again, a huge amount of the, the waste. So I guess we're moving in the right direction. This is as hopeful, I guess, as it gets. So, okay, so tighter regulations. Again, as Jean points out, we don't know how well they're being monitored, any of these facilities, but at least the law is moving in the right direction, which is the first thing. Tighter regulations on resource use and discharges. The two other things that I found as I, again, I searched the web that seemed hopeful to me was that there is a higher consumer demand for organic meat. So that means that at least there is a market for people who who are putting less into the environment. So if that can continue to grow, that's going to help decrease what goes into the environment. And the other thing is, and this is, I guess, what this talk basically is about, is lower consumer demand for meat in general. So as all of us continue to become more and more vegetarian, we are contributing so much to reducing the amount of impact, negative impact on the environment. So, you know, for those of you who are vegetarians or who are thinking about it, Congratulations. Thank you very much. You're really doing a lot. You, don't, you maybe didn't even know it, but you're really doing a lot to, to save the planet for everybody else, all the other people and all the other species who are sharing it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have a, we have a question. Okay, one question. Or if anybody wants to say anything, too, you know. Gatherings like tonight are our primary means of educating. There are, we have three pillars to the basis of our, uh, the thrust of our education. One of them is protection of the environment, of course, animal rights, and um, human health. So it's true, as Linda said earlier, fewer people seem to be 
interested in vegetarianism for the purpose of environmentalism. And there are fewer speakers available and fewer people are available to write articles for the newsletter. But we look for them. We try. And we, we hope to find them where they are. Yeah. You know, I don't know specifically... Um, percentage-wise factory farms, but I do know, I mean, I can't, actually can't say specifically percentage-wise for any of it, but I do know that um, for livestock production in general, like grazing, um, water and land, water rights and land use and all of that is highly subsidized. I can't give you a statistic, but I know that I've read in many places that if we knew how much hamburger, for instance, actually cost, how much our tax dollars, without us knowing it, are going into producing meat, whether we eat it or not, we would be flabbergasted and people would not buy meat. I can't remember how much, but it's like, you know, like $28 a pound for a pound of hamburger kind of a thing. That, and that's hidden cost to us. I, I have a question. Because you come from the Office of Sustainability, uh-huh. I was just wondering... Um, oh, good. My boss is going to be excited that you're asking about it. <laughs> also because we're looking at, you know, um, plants providing us with all the necessary goods supposed to to, you know, flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, how much agricultural land would be needed to sustain um, our population on the, on, in Hawaii? Mm-hmm. I would say, how much agricultural land would be needed to sustain um, our food supply? Because we import so much, and yet we have thousands of acres of agricultural land being unused. Today, right now, right. on this island, right. how much land would be needed to sustain our population? Just a comment. The reason why is because I work in the legislature this past session, uh-huh. and there were a number of bills coming out of the university encouraging, you know, um, uh, agricultural diversity for, mm-hmm. for economic reasons, mm-hmm. for health reasons, mm-hmm. for obesity, mm-hmm. yet not, not every bill can pass, but very few of these you know, uh, health conscious bills using our natural resources in that, in that land mm-hmm. were actually meaningful oh, to, mm-hmm. the of, you know, to the rest of the legislature. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm not a member, but I'm just looking at, you know, our economic survival, our health survival, our mm-hmm. use of our natural land. You know, this, your office probably may have a lot to do with raising the level of consciousness through intervention right. meetings like the Vegetarian Society mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not just affect um, you know, the legislators, but for every single person on this island. Mm-hmm. Island. Linda will be here to talk to any of you who have further suggestions or questions. Again, we have refreshments, low-fat vegan outside. Please stay, socialize also. We have a large selection of free literature in the back, as well as a few books for sale as well as our famous, brand new Vegetarian Society t-shirts. So we'd really like to get these out to increase our visibility. Thank you so much for coming. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.